Good morning. It's always good when you know the difference between morning and afternoon. It's a good way to start the day. From my left, we have Budget Director Robert Mejica, always smiling because that is our financial forecast. It's all smiles. Melissa DeRosa, Secretary to the Governor. From my far right, we have Dr. James Malatris, Dr. Howard Zucker. To my immediate right, Mariah Kennedy Cuomo, who is on special volunteer assignment for the state, working for her father, very pleasant boss. We're a little sad today, Mariah and I, because the boyfriend has left the premises, returned to his home state. That's okay, that old expression. If you love something, let it go, and it will return to you, and if it doesn't return, then it was never meant to be. Words to that effect. Uh, numbers are headed in the right direction today. Hospitalizations are down. Net change in hospitalizations are down. Intubations are down again. Number of new cases down, but it was a long road down. Slow decline, fast spike, slow decline. That's what, what has happened all across uh, the country. Uh, number of deaths still painfully high, uh, not down, up a little bit. Uh, the overall direction is right, but this is a Painful, painful, tragic uh, number of lives lost, and they are all in our thoughts and prayers. Uh, you look at the entire experience, you see we're stabilized basically with where we were before we had this dramatic increase. Uh, and one of the things we've learned through this is uh, smart wins. It's not about politics, it's not about emotion, you're dealing with a virus. The virus doesn't respond to politics. The virus doesn't have an ideology. The virus isn't red or blue. It is a virus that is attacking people. It's about science. It's about numbers. It's about data. Uh, and SMART wins the battle. If you follow that guidance and that theory, uh, we're always looking at and researching the numbers. Where are the cases coming from? How do we reduce the numbers? You look all across the country, it's lower income communities, uh, predominantly minority, where we're still seeing an increase in the numbers. Uh, we looked at that in New York City. We did a very extensive research project, and it is true you can look at where the cases are coming, look at the testing data by geographic area, by zip code, and find out where the cases are coming from. We asked Northwell Health, which is the largest health system in the state, to do a, an extensive test for us. We're in the midst of that test, uh, but we have back about 8,000 tests, which is a very large sample. And uh, the data is very powerful and informs what we're doing going forward. The test was done in New York City because that's where we have the highest predominance of cases. Uh, but in lower income communities, communities of color, we partnered with the faith-based community, with churches to conduct tests we found about 27% of the individuals testing positive. 27%, that's compared to the New York City general population of about 19%, okay? The Bronx had the highest percentage, 34%, again, compared to a citywide average of 19%. Then Brooklyn, then Manhattan, then Queens. Staten Island was right at the New York City uh, overall number. Uh, but you take a place like the Bronx, it's 34% compared to 19%, just to give you an idea. And the data shows not just a high positive, not just that a high number of people had the positive, uh, but 
the spread is continuing in those communities, and that's where the new cases are coming from, okay? And you can literally do that on a zip code basis. The, for example, Morrisania in the Bronx, 43% of the people tested positive, 43% compared to New York City general average of 19%. Hospitalization rate, 3.2 people for every 100,000. Compared to 1.8, it is double the hospitalization rate, okay? So be smart. Let's use the numbers, let's research. Where are people who are infected? Where are the new cases coming from? Where is the spread continuing? Low-income communities, communities of color. Uh, they tend to be high Latino, high African-American population. And we're seeing that pattern continue in zip codes, lower income, predominantly minority. Brownsville, Brooklyn, 41%, double the city average. That happens to be 80% African American, but again, uh, just about double the rate of hospitalization. So that's where the cases are still coming from. That's where the virus is still spreading. Uh, but again, you look at the data, you see it uh, over and over again by zip code by select communities within the city. Uh, my old neighborhood, Hollis, Queens, 35% compared to 19%. So it's all across the city, less than Staten Island, higher in communities of color and lower income communities. Uh, I want to thank the con congressional delegation who uh, helped organize this partnership between Northwell and the faith-based community. Getting 8,000 tests in a short period of time is not easily done. Uh, Congressman Hakeem Jeffries uh, came up with this idea about uh, 10 days ago, organized it quickly. I want to thank uh, Hakeem. I also want to thank Congresswoman Velasquez and Congresswoman Clark uh, for helping us getting, getting it organized. The faith-based community has been uh, great here. Reverend Brawley uh, and Reverend Rivera organize those churches for us. So we have the data, we have the research, uh, and now we have to take the next step, okay? We did the research, we have the data, we know what's happening. Now, what do we do about it? That's always step two. And we're going to develop targeted strategies to these highly impacted communities. What we're seeing in New York City is going to be true across the state. Uh, Northwell Health is going to double the number of churches that they're working in, 44 total churches. Uh, we're going to partner with Somos Community Care, uh, and I want to thank them very much for stepping up. They're going to open 28 additional testing sites in uh, these zip codes that fit this profile. We're going to focus on public housing. When you think about everything we're talking about, socially distanced, et cetera, and then think about public housing and how hard it is in public housing to do the things we're talking about. Uh, I worked in public housing all across this uh, country when I was the Housing and Urban Development Secretary during the Clinton administration. Socially distance. How do you socially distance in an elevator in a public housing complex? How do you socially distance in the hallways of a public housing complex? How do you socially distance in the lobby? How do you socially distance in a, a small playground? that it's attached to public housing. So uh, we understand the challenge, and ready responders are going to uh, increase the testing in 40 public housing developments in New York City. So this is gonna be a very extensive effort between Northwell and Somos. You'll have 72 faith-based sites. Uh, you'll then have ready responders in public housing. And we wanna now take the next step, which is outreach programs getting the PPE into the community, getting the hand sanitizer into the community, explaining social distancing and why that's so important, and explain how this virus spreads. It's a public health education effort. Uh, and 
you know, I've been all across the state. You drive through some of these communities and you can see that social distancing isn't happening, PPE is not being used, and hence the virus spreads. Uh, and again, we did the research in New York City because that's where we have the predominance of cases. But it is going to be true in every community across this state and across this nation. You tell me the zip codes that have the predominantly minority community, lower income community, I will tell you the communities where you're going to have a higher positive and you're going to have increased spread and you're going to have increased hospitalization. Uh, I'm asking all local governments to do the same thing that we did in New York City. Focus on low income communities, do the testing and do the outreach. Do the testing and do the outreach. That's where the cases are coming from. That's where the new hospitalizations are coming from. That's what's going into the hospital system. That's where you're going to see the highest number of deaths. So that is our challenge. Uh, on reopening, which we're doing across the state, we do it on the numbers, we do it on the metrics. Every New Yorker can go to the website and find out where their community is. Capital District will reopen today. We're working with uh, religious institutions. Right now they can have up to 10 people with strict social distancing guidelines uh, at religious gatherings. We've asked them to consider drive-in and parking lot services for uh, religious ceremonies, but we're gonna be working with uh, our Interfaith Advisory Council. Um, our Interfaith Advisory Council has representatives of the religious community across the state, all different religions. I understand their desire to get back to religious ceremonies as soon as possible. As a former altar boy, I get it. Uh, I think it, even at this time of stress and when people are so anxious and so confused, I think those religious ceremonies can be very comforting. But we need to find out how to do it and do it safely and do it smartly. The last thing we want to do is have a religious ceremony that winds up uh, having more people infected. Uh, religious ceremony, by definition, is a gathering, right? It's a large number of people coming together. We know from New Rochelle, Westchester, the first hot spot, that religious ceremonies can be very dangerous. So. We all want to do the same thing. The question is, how do we do it? And how do we do it smartly and efficiently? And I'll be talking with members of the religious community uh, in doing just that. And I'm sure that we can come up with a way that uh, does it, but does it intelligently. People ask all the time, well, now we're reopening. What's going to happen? What's going to happen is what we make happen. There is no predestined course here. There is nothing that is preordained. What is going to happen is a consequence of our choices and a consequence of our action. It's that simple. If people are smart and if people are responsible and if the employers who are opening those businesses do it responsibly, if employees are responsible, if individuals are responsible, then you will see the infection rates stay low. If people get arrogant, if people get cocky, if people get casual, if people become undisciplined, you will see that infection rate go up. It is that simple. This has always been about what we do. It's never been about what government mandated. Government cannot mandate behavior of people. And it certainly can't mandate behavior of 19 million people. It can give you the facts. It can give you the facts that lead to an inevitable conclusion. And New Yorkers have been great about following the facts. But we're at another pivot point. Yes, we're reopening. Yes, the numbers are down. Yes, we can increase activity and increase economic activity. What is the consequence of that? It depends on what we do. Uh, do your part, wear a mask. Now, wearing a mask, I've been trying to communicate in a whole different set of ways. Uh, 
Mariah is heading up a project that she'll report on in a moment that's helping to communicate this message. But uh, it seems like a simple thing, wearing a mask, and it's apparently so simple that people think it's of no consequence. It happens to be of tremendous consequence. It is amazing how effective that mask actually is. And don't take my word for it. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a public health expert. Again, look at the facts. What shocks me to this day, and I would have lost a lot of money on this bet, how do frontline workers have a lower infection rate than the general population? If I said to you, who's going to have a higher infection rate? Nurses in an emergency room, doctors in an emergency room, or the general population who has a higher infection rate? I think most people would have said, the nurses in the emergency room, the doctors in the emergency room, the hospital staff, they're going to have a higher infection rate because they're dealing with COVID po positive people all day long. Not true. How do nurses and doctors have a lower infection rate than the general population? How do transit workers who are on the buses and subways all day long have a lower infection rate than the general population? How does the NYPD, police officers who show up, who are dealing with people all day long, how do they have a lower infection rate? How does the NYPD have almost half the infection rate of New York City? How can it be? They're the police officers. They're wearing the mask. The mask works. Those surgical masks work. And it's in the data. It's not that I'm saying it. It's in the data. And it is, otherwise, it's inexplicable. Just look at that list. Transit workers are lower. Healthcare workers are lower. The police department is lower. The fire department is lower, which also has the EMTs who show up first and help a person get into an ambulance. They have a lower infection rate. The docs workers are the correction officials who are correction officers, who are in a prison, they're at 7%. State police, 3%. They wear the masks. Wear a mask. Remember all those pictures of people in China always wearing masks? Oh, I wonder why they wear all those masks. They were right. The masks work. They are protective and they work. Wear a mask. So on May 5th, we launched the contest to come up with video messages prepared by New Yorkers to try to communicate the message of wear a mask better than I was communicating the message of wear a mask because my daughters were quick to point out that maybe it was my communication skills which were preventing the effective communication of the wear the mask message. Caveat is my daughters often say it is my communication skills, which are the problem uh, in the home, in society at large. So uh, Mariah volunteered to uh, run a competition where we asked New Yorkers to do a 30 second ad and the winner of the competition would be the ad that the state runs. With that, I will turn it over to Mariah for her update and her report. Um, today we're excited to be sharing the five ad finalists that our team has selected for the New York State Wear a Mask ad contest and these Ad finalists, which we will be showing shortly, are in the running for winning this contest and being shown as a public service announcement. Starting today, people can go to wearamask.ny.gov 
to vote for their favorite ad, and voting will be open through Memorial Day. On May 26th, we'll be announcing the final winning ad, and we're so grateful to all the New Yorkers who have submitted um, one of the over 600 submissions, and we will be sharing honorable mentions as well so that you can see even more of the great videos. Great, 600 submissions, and these are the five finalists that people can view and vote on. Okay, let's see the five finalists. I wear a mask for my fellow New Yorkers. My mama, who's a healthcare worker. Nurses and doctors. For my father. For the marginalized communities who don't have access to adequate healthcare. For my children. My community. Essential workers. Transit workers. The immunocompromised. I wear a mask so we can get back to work. Go to school. Share a meal. See a movie. Hug my friends. Dance together. Go to the theater. See our families. Continue to show support. Take care of each other. Save lives. Stay strong. We've been stuck inside our homes while our everyday heroes have been working overtime for New York to reopen and stay open. We all need to do our part and show that we care. Look, man, I wear a mask to protect you. You wear a mask to protect me. Let's all wear a mask to stop the spread of coronavirus and save lives. When we show up in the mask, we're showing up for each other. Show your love for New York because New York loves you. textbook says politicians lead. No, sometimes the people lead and the politicians follow. Follow the American people. They will do the right thing. There is still a right thing. Maybe right thing is a New York expression. Great. I know that guy, by the way. <laughs> I see him all the time. Uh, so those are the five finalists. People can vote. They go to the uh, coronavirus.health.ny.gov, wear mask to vote. Vote between now and May 25th. Winner announced May 26th. How many times can a person vote? Once. Once. No voter fraud on this election. No absentee ballots, no polling place. Is there early voting? I don't think so. All right, so that's great. Thank you very much for doing that. We'll announce that winner May 26th. Over 600 submissions, though, and they are really great. I've seen a number of them. Uh, we're gonna post the honorable mentions also, uh, but all 600 will be available to look at, and they're really creative, and they have different voices from all across the state. So I want to thank very much uh, everyone who, who participated uh, because they really are, they are special. And with that, we'll take any questions that you might have. Go 